Hi everybody, my name is uh, Dirk Kager and I'm currently a research scientist at the Swiss Federal Research Institute WSL in Switzerland and today I want to give you a short overview about climate data. And I actually want to show you what kind of climate data is available out there and I would like to start with a short introduction to global circulation models or GCMs, to earth system models, to reanalysis data, and go over to bias corrected data, and then come to station interpolations and statistically downscaled data, which is something most people are more or less more commonly um, familiar with. And then I go to more novel approaches such as model output statistics or remote sensing data. And at the end, I would like to give you some advice on selecting climatic variables and how to select climate models, for example, for um, future impact studies. So, global circulation models, so also GCMs, are data which is available from many institutions and they're actually rather simple since they're just a physical representation of the um, climate system and their basic form is nothing else than a simple solving the Navier-Stokes equations on a rotating sphere which kind of sounds um, complicated, but mathematically it's actually not that hard. Um, so they more or less represent what we understand in terms of physics. And many of these models are so-called numerical models. They are based on um, partial differential equations. And unfortunately, these partial equations um, differential equations are very hard to solve or impossible to solve. That's why we need numerical solvers. And that's why they also really um, intensive when it comes to computational power. So these models exist more or less um, for 30, 40 years already. Um, and they have been improved and improved and improved over the years. So they're built up in a way so that they're um, a three-dimensional structure of the entire atmosphere. So you have these kind of grid boxes, which are here, and these ones are all linked via physical equations. For example, we have solar radiation, which goes in, and then passes through these grid boxes, and then we have transfer functions between the grid boxes, and these transfer functions um, then calculate the next value for the next grid box, and so on and so on. And depending how large these grid boxes actually are, um, the more computational intensive the model gets. And um, when you just add now a fourth dimension, you have a 4D model which runs through time and gives you a rather good um, idea about the physical state of the atmosphere, about the land and about the ocean. And what's usually the case is that you have different model components which calculate part of the atmosphere on an ocean component and the land component. And if you're interested how these things actually work, there's a super nice small little web page called Build Your Own Earth. And um, here you can simply set a bunch of boundary conditions, which are not something else than, uh, for example, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, um, some trace gases, um, the solar constants um, and the eccentricity of the Earth and so on. And from these basic parameters, 
um, you can already calculate how the temperature, for example, of the Earth's surface is um, at a given point in time. And um, I think it's always nice to like play around with these things to get like a feeling of how actually this um, climate models work a little bit because they're actually just like a few parameters which you can tweak and then they already create an atmosphere. And um, you can do this for recent times, for example, for ancient times or even explore alien planets here. So these metals have a high degree of generalism, so they can be easily applied to different kinds of topographies, to different kinds of atmospheres and boundary conditions, simply because they're physical models. And um, this is, for example, just what you could get then as an output from such a GCM. So here on the left side, we see um, the current day temperatures um, and on the right side, we could see the temperatures during the LGM at the same months, where you can see that it's colder here and warmer here. Um, and this really um, gives you a little bit of an understanding how it, uh, these climate models actually work when you start playing around with them. So just as a really um, small thing which you could explore on your own. So... Modern GCMs have usually a fully coupled atmosphere, ocean, ice component, even a land component, and they numerically integrate physical, chemical, biological um, principles. And the nice things about GCMs is that there really are things you can apply through time. So you can go into the past, you can go into the present, or... Um, simulate future climate and this is what example what is done and um, CMIP5 for example or CMIP6 which is currently underway uh, where we try to estimate the future state of the um, earth's climate and the next generation which actually also couple climatic um, atmosphere simulations ocean simulations to dynamic vegetation models, for example, or carbon models, they're called Earth system models, and they're a little bit more complex, but that's more or less where we're moving to nowadays. Um, the problem with GCMs is that they actually have a really coarse resolution. So currently we're about um, 50 kilometers in grid box size, so the first ones were like 400 kilometers, as you can see here, this is like rather large. Um, and you can see that the North American continent is not so well represented here. Uh, the finer you go, um, the more detail you can see. So the problem, however, is that this is very, very computationally expensive. So... With regional models, we're already reaching 9 kilometers. And there are actually models which can go at 1 kilometer. But calculating them takes actually longer than a day for each day which we simulate. So we'll never really reach um, a computational efficient time there. Um, so the idea is that about in five to ten years, probably a little bit later, um, we finally go down to one kilometer, but for the moment, that's simply not available. So a few words on Earth's system models. Um, system models, as already said, are a little bit of a better representation of the land surface processes. So, for example, they link dynamic vegetation models, which include competition between trees, for example, um, disturbance regimes, um, growth dynamics, um, land use change, and so, uh, and so on, even glacier melt to the atmosphere and give feedbacks. So these models are much more complex and, as you can imagine, are also much harder to um, to run and much more computationally 
um, expensive. And up to now, they usually also use just like simple classifications of vegetation, for example, broadleaf forest or needleleaf forest, but they don't go down to a species level, for example, since this is really hard to parameterize. Um, what they do, however, they already give us a pretty good idea about the carbon cycling um, and um, the vegetation dynamics actually can be linked dynamically to the climate systems. So this might be um, a really interesting thing for the future if these models really will be applied to high resolutions in the future. Um, aside from global circulation models and ESMs, we also have reanalysis data. And reanalysis is kind of a different beast. Um, it's observational data, which has been accumulated from various sources. And uh, the most modern ones are the ones which are um, from the satellite area, starting in the late 70s. And what you see here on the left side is actually all the data sources which went into the ERA interim um, reanalysis. And you have a lot of um, radiative satellites where re um, reflectance rates which were recorded from satellites went into the models. Um, but you also have traditional observations from climate stations, radio zones, and so on. And all these go into a, a system which is quite similar to, to GCMs linked physically and um, is then calculated by algorithms which we use, for example, for, um, for weather forecasts. And in that way, you can also get parameters which are not directly um, uh, observed, like um, um, direct surface precipitation, um, stuff like that, which then um, give you a very good representation of a lot of factors within the atmosphere. Um, they have usually a very high temporal resolution, so the newer ones are like hourly resolution. They're still a bit coarse, so uh, the most modern one, ERA 5, goes down to 25 kilometer grid box size, roughly, and um, they have nevertheless still biases. So we're never 100% sure if they're real observational data or if they're also, for example, just underestimate rainfall or overestimate rainfall because they cannot resolve convective precipitation, for example, or um, there are errors in the observations, there are errors in the um, satellite reflectance rates, and so on and so on. Um, nevertheless, they're, they're getting better over the years and there are very... Um, a nice source for lots of parameters from the atmosphere or the land surface. And um, they are also easily downloadable. You can just like go um, on um, the climate data storage, which is um, a U funded site, and you can just download the data directly from there. There's a nice um, API even so that whatever algorithm you want to link, you can just like directly code that in and just download the, the data directly from the um, from the reanalysis. And they even give you monthly data as well. As I already said, it's just like on a coarse resolution. Um, so what you can see here, um, 0.25 times 20. Uh, 0.25 degrees for the atmosphere and the ocean actually is a little bit um, coarser resolution. Um, as I already mentioned, many of this data actually comes with biases. So they're never actually 100% correct. But if we want to use it for species distribution models, for example, we would like to have the most accurate data as possible, of course. 
Um, and here's a representation of such biases, for example, from GCMs. When you look, for example, at the surface temperatures, which in September form different kinds of GCMs, which are the orange lines here, then you can see that there's a huge spread. So it's about 10 degrees here even for some models, which are a part of each other. And these blue ones here, those are the actual observations. And the trends are actually correct within the, um, the models, but the values themselves are way off. And the same here for more derived factors, such the um, sea ice extends, which is then estimated from the, um, from the surface temperatures, for example. You see that the observations, the trend still fits, but again, it's way off. And many of these climate models, or almost all of them, have a certain bias. And for impact studies such as SDMs or whatever ecological studies we want to do, we would like to have bias-corrected data. And correcting this error in um, global climate models is actually possible via a large variety of um, of algorithms, and I want to give you a little bit of a, of a short overview about a few of them so that you can get an idea what kind of bias-corrected data is out there when you kind of need it. Um, one more small example is here is, for example, um, surface precipitation from different GCMs compared to observational data in a Taylor plot. So down here we have the standard deviation towards the observations and here we have the correlation. So this gives us an idea about the, the absolute error and this gives us an idea about the uh, spatial structure a little bit. So you can see that most models predict um, precipitation to about 30% certainty and this is rather normal. Whatever um, model you have, you hardly get it above 70% of accuracy when it comes to precipitation. For temperature, these values are higher, but temperature is easier to model, so that's why um, we get the, the better um, representations compared to observations in here. So how do we get like this error, which we still, hear, still have here, this 30% uncertainty out of the models, and get them closer to the observations. And this is what we can do using um, different kinds of bias um, correction algorithms. Uh, and the simplest one is, for example, the, the delta change method. So when you, for example, have um, an observational data set and you want to use this um, to project it into the future, then you can just like take the mean difference between um, the simulated one which you have, you have in the future and the simulated one you have today. So let's say your model predicts you two degrees um, increase in temperatures in a certain area, then you take this two degrees and just use an observational data that set like here in blue, and add this to the um, observational data set. And this is kind of easy to do and very often done. So, for example, the Wirkland data set does that, the Chelsea data set does that. So when you want to have future um, CMIP5 scenarios, for example, a very easy method, just like take the anomalies in temperature and just add them to the higher resolution grid from the coarser resolution grid. Um, the problem here is a little bit that this does not preserve all aspects of the climate system. Um, so certain things, for example, you might have um, a different behavior for high temperatures than you have for low temperatures. And this is what you can see, for example, here. So in 
precipitation, where this is rather common, um, you can have different pros uh, probabilities of high rainfall events compared to smaller rainfall events, and therefore also different kinds of um, transfer functions along these this lines here. So this is the cumulative probability of a precipitation event of 5 millimeters per day, for example. And what you see that there are simulation between observations and um, sim uh, the difference between observations and simulations is not always the same wherever we look. For example, at a high cumulative probability, the difference is smaller than on a low one. And to preserve this, we can use something which is called like quantile mapping, where you actually map different parts of the cumulative probability function um, onto another data set. So you just take the lower quantile, the middle quantile, the upper quantiles, um, and kind of fit a different function. So in this way, you better preserve that there might be different relationships between models and observations and for low rainfall events or high rainfall events and get a better representation of these different trends you kind of have in the probabilities of um, events occurring. Um, there is, however, a slight problem with that. Whenever you do a univariate bias correction, you might destroy the correlation structure between variables. And whatever what that means is um, when you, for example, make a correction of precipitation and a correction of cloud cover, it might happen that you end up with simulated days where you have precipitation but no clouds. This is physically impossible, of course. Um, and this just simply comes from the fact that while we do a bias correction, we destroy the correlation structure. It's more a problem when you have high temporal resolution than for, for example, monthly data or, or annual data. But it can, of course, lead to problems in subsequent analysis when we, for example, want to calculate um, evapotranspiration, soil moisture, or something like that, where we need several input variables which should actually be linked to each other in the correct physical way. And one way to do that is simply do a multivariate um, bias correction. And this is quite simple illustrated by these different pictures here, because a climate data set is actually not much different than a picture. It just gives you a map of precipitation or temperature or whatsoever, and we can also just like think of the same thing as a picture with three variables, where the variables are actually the red, green, and blue color channels of the image. And if we want to correct um, uh, a model based on these three variables, we actually have to get different things which need to be tuned in. For example, the brightness, but also the colors need to be correct. And let's assume this upper picture here is the observed historical data set. And then here we have GCM simulations. And what you can already see, first the brightness is off, and then we have um, too much green in here, yellow, so the colors are also off. So this is our bias. The model does not represent exactly um, what we are observing. Although it's both trees here and, and we have some open fields, so it gets the general picture, but it's off colors and um, brightness. And if we do a simple quantile mapping, what happens is that we here, for example, tune in the brightness quite well, but still the colors are off. So here we have a yellow, which is not in the upper observed data, for example, and also the red is not there. Um, and this has something to do that we are just destroying the, 
um, the covariance structure between the three channels. But if we take into account that the combination of two channels gives us a specific color, for example, so we do a multivariate quantile mapping, then we actually get a way better representation of um, the observed data which we have up here. So what you can see, for example, the yellow is gone, there's less red in here, and these uppermost and the lowermost pictures are actually the closest to each other. Um, so, so much for the um, bias correction, and now we can over to another problem, and that actually means how do we deal with the coarse resolution of the climate models. And again, I want to illustrate that here um, on a picture. So, if you have a high resolution picture here on the, um, on the right side, getting that to a coarse resolution is really easy because we can just aggregate the data and take the mean within these grid cells and, and there we go, we have the coarse resolution. So that's a really simple thing. But how do you go the other way? How do you get from a coarse pixelated image to a finer resolution? And you will never be able to do that 100%, but we can get close at least. Um, there are different kinds of algorithms can do that. For example, you can do it with machine learning. This is just an um, example from an algorithm or several algorithms which um, Google used to get from very coarse data to more um, refined data. So we have here the input data on the very left and then the truth right beside it. And then you can see how different algorithms kind of estimate what the picture would actually look like. Um, and you can see that some of them perform really good, some of them perform really bad. Um, for example, here the gun, which somehow has a bias towards creating zombie faces, or um, the bicubic spline, which is actually just like smoothing the entire thing out, and you still can't see anything, um, towards some of the algorithms which work slightly better. The problem is these things need a lot of training data. They are um, very hard to parameterize, and that's why we get different kinds of outputs. And the similar problem we have when we want to downscale climate data. The only difference is that at least about the climate system, we already know what the physics behind them are, at least to a large degree. So we're a little bit um, farther than when it comes to just detecting faces. So the easiest method how you get to a smaller resolution, um, let's say one kilometer or um, even higher, is if you just simply interpolate your data. There's different ways how you can do that. You can, for example, use a spline interpolation. You um, can use quidging. Um, and it assumes that wherever you measure climate data at a station, that the next grid cell where you haven't measured is, is somehow similar. So you have spatial autocorrelation in your um, climatic factors. Um, this works okay for, for core scales when you have a rather high station density. And example data sets which do that and are based on climate observations like stations are, for example, GPCC or the crew data set where you have stations and then you just interpolate between them and say, okay, whatever is in between them will be somehow like the mean, for example. Um, this can, however, just as a short notice, still create lots of biases, as stations themselves are not optimum. Um, I very often have the feeling that people take stations as the absolute truth. But precipitation stations, for example, 
can have an immense bias. So they can underestimate precipitation in snow-driven regimes by up to 90%, for example. And what you see here is how high this bias, for example, is in the um, in the Chelsea data set, um, where we kind of underestimate to a large degree precipitation in high mountain ecosystems or um, high mountain systems in general or over snow-covered areas. And the way we estimate this bias is that there's data out, out there how much river discharge we have, for example. And then you can check how much rainfall must have fallen in a, um, in a, re in a catchment area and then use that as a correction algorithm, as a basis for the correction algorithm. Anyhow, the next step how you can actually arrive at higher resolutions is if you do a so-called dynamical downscaling. And dynamical downscaling just uses a uh, same algorithm as a GCM, for example, and just applies it to a smaller resolution. And you take probably a few more factors into account and use the GCM as the overall boundary conditions for your regional model, and then you nest your model inside there and let it run. There are this gives you a better representation of the small scale um, effects of topography, for example, or land cover on climate, but it also passes along any bias which is already in the coarser model and it's very computational intensive. So you cannot just like do that uh, within a day or something like that. And it's really just bound to the physics which are in the model. And not all of these small-scale effects, so for example, deep convection or whatsoever, are very well represented within the models. Yet another way how you can reach at smaller scale um, uh, data is if you use statistical downscaling. And statistical downscaling is much like, like SDM. So you, you want to make a relationship between the numbers of predictors, for example, elevation, and then have stations and use the predictor with the stations together to get a transfer function and fit the parameterized this function and then predict it onto the um, predictors to get an even surface of climate variables. This works okay when you have um, a high station density. It gets really hard when you have a low st station density or uneven station density because then it will become almost impossible to correctly parameterize. Um, your um, your coefficients in the model. And I will show you a little example of that, why it's really um, tricky to do so, especially for areas where you hardly have stations. Examples for this data are, for example, WorkLim or Damit or Prism, which are all um, approaches which use um, statistical downscaling in some form or another. So let's assume we want to statistically downscale precipitation um, or temperature from station data. And here is a little representation where you have two stations in red. One measures 10 degrees, it's a little bit on a higher elevation. One measures 20 degrees on a low elevation. And now you take elevation as the predictor in here and want to estimate how high is the temperature at this yellow spot here where you don't have a station. So you can just make a linear regression and estimate, yeah, well, here you get the, the correct um, temperature estimated at about um, 5 degrees or whatsoever. Now, what happens when we do that to 
precipitation, for example. Let's say it, at the lower station it rains 2 millimeters, here it rains 8 millimeters. So if we fit um, a simple regression model to that, it will tell us up here we have the highest precipitation. But this is only the case if it really rains more on this side. Because let's say wind comes from the left here, the air masses rise and it rains here, and here's the rain shadow on the other side. But what if we now change the direction in this system? We can see the wind comes from here, it rains more on the windward side, and here on the leeward side it rains less. But since the stations are fixed in their elevation, we cannot make the correct um, approximation here anymore of the, of the parameters, and we end with an estimated value which is well below the true value. So wherever your station is, that makes a huge difference um, to estimate actually what kind of rainfall you will get at an unknown location, as long as you're not taking into account these oreographic effects of, of rainfall, for example. Um, so, getting back to the problem of how we can get from coarse to small resolution, um, there is, of course, um, a few other ways how to do that. So, for example, we can just take the information we have here completely um, and ignore stations in total and make something which we call model output statistics. So, for example, if we want to estimate precipitation, then we know that it, for example, rains 10 millimeters in some areas, and this somehow is related to um, values at a smaller scale. So it's in the mean value of this or the accumulated value of the um, of this um, uh, precipitation at the smaller scale. So we can make a mathematical relationship of this, how these two are linked, and then we, for example, see, okay, this precipitation at the coarser scale is the sum of the precipitation at the smaller scales. So the only thing which we need is this distribution here. But we still don't know that. So one way to do it is, for example, estimate the patterns. So we just want to find something which actually looks similar to precipitation but doesn't have the actual values of precipitation yet. And this is the side here. So we estimate one with another. And we can do that, for example, with this nice equation down here, which gives us an idea where we are. Are we at the windward side of a mountain? Are we in the leeward side of the mountain? Or are we high up the mountain? Or are we low up the mountain, for example? These model output statistics are actually a special case of, of statistical downscaling, and they create a relationship between the output variables of a GCM, for example, or a reanalysis, and map those onto higher resolution topographic variables. And they approximate topographic effects often via parametrization. So that means we don't know the exact relationship between topography and precipitation, for example, so we use an approximation of that. And, um, for example, we can use temperature lapse rate. We know how high the change in temperature is with altitude in the three-dimensional structure of a GCM or a reanalysis, and we can calculate the lapse rate out of that and then make uh, map this relationship onto topography, for example. So this avoids usually problems from the uneven station density which we have and gives us also clear links um, via equations from topography to climatic variables. Although not necessarily built on physical properties, but rather on statistical approximations. But again, this inherits biases from the driving GCM or the reanalysis, which can, however, be co corrected in um, subsequent steps again.
One nice thing about this is that you can actually they're scale independent. So I can use the same algorithm to apply it on a 25 kilometer grid, on a 5 kilometer grid, 1 kilometer grid, or here, um, for example, on a 5 meter resolution for for the Canary Islands. Um, this is just an example of a of a small mountain and the temperatures um, which are here. Um, influenced by the solar radiation where you can see in January for example that the southern sites are much warmer than the northern sites which are shaded and this is different of course in July where the temperatures are all slightly higher and we have a different pattern um, of temperature uh, temperature and of course you can derive from this um, easily derived variables such as snowfall, for example, and again, these are kind of scale independent then. Then the last step or the most modern data is remote sensing data. You've already seen examples of that from the cloud cover data, but there is of course lots of other data out there for example, precipitation data, which we have, or MODIS data for land surface temperatures, and so on and so on. So very good sources for these are NASA data or ERA data, JAXA data from the Japanese Space Agency. Um, this data have a very short latency, so a very high temporal resolution. However, they usually do have gaps and, and artifacts. So the paths of the satellites are not um, always covering all the planet at the same time. So you have, for example, what you can, can see down here, you have like gaps in the records. Um, very often you get problems from um, reflectance rates, for example. It's really hard to distinguish between ice and clouds. Um, you you just have like interference with certain things so you will see that as soon as you look into remote sensing data that there is actually um, lots of artifacts usually in there and if you go to higher derived products for example level three products then they usually are already bias adjusted by stations or some kind of algorithms to tune in values such as temperature precipitation and there are still cores in resolution. So for example, if you compare trim data with that of Chelsea or Worklum, then you can kind of see that the, the data is actually way coarser than one kilometer, while some of the data like um, the cloud cover you've seen earlier is available at one kilometer resolution. A uh, nice source where you can download lots of these data is for example, um, NASA's Giovanni, where you can just simply select um, whatever factor, climatic factor you're interested in, and then select a platform or instrument, let's say the, the GPM, uh, Global Precipitation Measuring Mission, then, um, then I have for a given time period just simply have a map plotted of the um, of the precipitation over this time period. But what you also see, there are gaps in the records, right? So you don't have these smooth, even surfaces and often not at one kilometer. Um, a very modern approach is to also merge this data actually with observational data. So you use stations, for example, um, as a direct measurement of precipitation and then link this with the spatial patterns which you see on the from the satellites and then tune both in and arrive at a product which is accurate when it comes to the spatial distribution of rainfall and the actual amounts of rainfall. This still has the same problems as all products. We're still not 100% sure if we actually get the right amounts. And we have inherited artifacts from the remote sensing data 
as well as inherited artifacts from the stations as well. So, at the end, I would just like to give you a little bit of an overview about how to select climatic variables. And when it comes to species distribution models, what people very often do is just like use all 90 bioclim variables which are out there, mainly from WorldClim, and then they use um, all of these together in an SDM, have the algorithm select whatever is the best fit, and then build the SDM with that. And this can be kind of tricky because often these variables, these 19 bioclim variables, are supposed to reflect um, relevant climatic factors for biological organisms, but they are just proxies of those. And many of them are highly correlated to each other. So all the precipitation variables and all the temperature variables are actually highly correlated at the global level. They don't necessarily need to be at the local level, but at the global level they certainly are. Um, and not all of them are equally useful. Um, they have been useful for quite some time, but we have used them for, for over a decade now, and we also uncovered a lot of problems with them. And another point is that certain things which are important for organisms are missing. So we hardly have solar radiation in there, soil water balance, there's no relative humidity, etc., etc. And these are all important variables when we think of certain kinds of organisms. So try not necessarily to use them without thinking first, but select actually those which are um, interesting for your organismic group. And a general advice on this is you should avoid the quarter variables. Uh, rather look for alternatives there. For example, precipitation of the warmest quarters often thought of being a proxy for um, the precipitation which falls during the summer or during the growing season. And the same with the temperature of the warmest quarter, which is given as the, the mean temperature of the growing season, and so on and so on. But actually, there are already variables out there which give you the correct estimation of the growing season precipitation or the growing season mean temperatures, etc., etc., and they might work better for whatever application you're looking for. Um, and these quarter variables can be especially tricky when we want to project things into the future or into the past, and I will show you later a picture why that is the case. Also, do not use all 19 bioclim variables at once. Um, this is kind of a problem because uh, many of them are, of course, strongly correlated to each other. So I would rather advise to make a pre-selection on climate variables which are actually relevant to your organism. And if you're unsure, just simply choose the most general ones. That usually works best. And here's a picture why the quarter variables can be quite tricky. Um, this is precipitation during the warmest quarter. And what you can see here are these artifacts which come in as bands here, for example, over the Amazon or here in, in Africa. And this has simply to do that the values are jumping between quarters. So here it's, for example, the, the mid-quarter of June, July, August, and then we go here just from one kilometer to, our, to another, we jump from um, July, August, September. And this, of course, accumulates different kinds of precipitation over that time, so you get these artificial bands. And these jumps between quarters can hop, happen not just spatially, they can also happen temporarily. And that's why it's a problem to use these variables, for example, when you go into the future. Also, it might be more useful to not just looking at mean variables, but also at extremes, because they usually work slightly better when you go for species distribution models, because they give you a 
better idea where actually the range boundaries of a species are rather than um, just taking the mean. Um, a nice saying, for example, um, says that when you stand on a um, hot plate with one foot and on a freezing plate on another um, plate, then you're good at average, but you're still one foot is burning and one is freezing. So um, the same is with the means. You actually want a better representation of the range. It might make sense to considering the extremes as well. Um, the last point I want to mention is something I get personally asked quite often is how to select actually the right um, GCMs when we go for future projections. And the problem with GCMs is a little bit that they are big black boxes. So many of them are not really published and we don't know the code of them. Um, that's not open source. A few are, but not all of them. And many of them have similar codes, so similar um, physics in there. And they're actually related to each other or just like uh, derivatives of each other. And here you can see, for example, the um, uh, genealogy of the models derived from their output. So models which are pretty close to each other in their output are grouped to each other. And you can see that often models from the same institution produce similar output um, or they are derived from each other and then, of course, they get um, similar output. So we cannot assume that similar output is necessarily something which is true. So we don't know the future state of the atmosphere. So the better thing is to actually take the entire uncertainty into account and say, well, a model which is up here is not necessarily worse than a model down here. So we want to take into account a lot of the uncertainty, and that's why we should take um, models into our impact studies, which are far from each other and give us different kinds of um, scenarios. And there are actually ways to do that. For example, when you look at an entire ensemble of models, you can see how much information content is lost when we remove these models. So this um, graphic here from, from Sanderson and Knutti actually um, shows a lot of models and what happens when they get removed from the from the ensemble. And the way you would select models then for your impact studies, you just simply start here and then how many models you actually want, you go to the left. So if you remove models from the very left, you hardly use any information. If you remove them here at the right, you lose more and more information. And that's why by adding them, you gain information. So from five models here, you have a lot more information on uncertainties and um, the climate system than you would have if you choose five models here on the left. And in generally, I would always say at least consider five CMIP5 or CMIP6 models in the future um, and two or uh, four RCPs for your impact studies or SDMs. Um, at the end, there is, of course, lots of um, uh, information out there in the net, which gives you a nice overview about um, different kinds of, of climate variables. For example, there is the climate data guide um, where you can have overviews and comparisons between precipitation data sets. You get a nice idea what is um, there, what is out there, what kind of um, data sets do exist. And then usually what you also have is some, some expert guidance, for example, on different data sets where you can see the key limitations, the, the strengths of the data, and so on. So 
And with this, I'm actually done. And I hope you enjoyed this small introduction to climate data. And goodbye.